Good, well thank you everyone. Um, so, glad to be here this morning. So my name's Tim, this is uh, Easter Sunday morning and we're here to celebrate, to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. We've already heard here from uh, Luke 24, so if you can turn again to Luke 24, um, and we'll skip down to uh, some verses a bit further along. So dropping down to verse 36. So we're with the disciples. They've already heard an account from the women about the resurrection. Um, and... Um, you know, these reports are beginning to filter back to them. And there's a couple of chaps who've um, met with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And um, they were planning on spending Easter weekend in Emmaus. And they've turned around and rushed straight back to Jerusalem to report the fact. And so we join them all at verse 36. While they were telling these things, he himself, that is to say, Jesus himself, stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it, because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything to eat? He gave them a piece of broiled, they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Now, he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ must suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that I've been clothed with power from on high, that I am a witness of these things, and that I'm going to proclaim to you repentance for forgiveness of sins in his name. And I want to start with verse 46, where it says it was necessary. Jesus himself is explaining to his disciples it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to die and to rise again on the third day. The crucifixion was not a mistake. It wasn't all going really well for Jesus and his disciples until he pushed it too far and the Romans intervened and he was arrested and faced an ignominious end. The crucifixion was not a mistake. It was his purpose right from the very beginning. Indeed, the scriptures say from the foundations of the earth. It was his purpose. It was his absolute purpose. Living a righteous life as he did tremendous beautiful example of living the law of love the example of humility of goodness compassion that wasn't enough his teachings spectacular and wonderful as they are the numerous parables so such a clever way of communicating such great truths. The Sermon on the Mount, 
the Lord's Prayer, the teaching of the Lord's Prayer. I mean, these teachings have transformed the world. But it wasn't enough. Even the miracles, numerous miracles, John says if they were all written down, there wouldn't be enough room in the world to contain all the books. And if you walk into a Christian bookshop, you get some idea of what he was going on about. Even all those miracles, that wasn't enough. That wasn't the real purpose. Yes, we preach Christ as a great example to us. We examine the scriptures, we look at the gospels, we learn from his example, we seek to follow his example of grace and humility and love. Yes, he was a great teacher, a great philosopher, having great wisdom of how mankind could live together in harmony and peace and fulfill its purpose. Yes, all of that is true. Yes, he was a great miracle worker, powerful miracle worker, and we seek to emulate that in his power today. Yes, all of that. We preach all of that. But that's not enough. We preach Christ crucified. Christ crucified. That has to be the centre of our focus. That has to be the centre of our worship. Christ crucified. Christ buried. Christ raised from the dead. Christ glorified. Christ ascended into the heavens, Christ reigning, Christ crucified. And it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because there's nothing particularly glamorous about it. There's nothing particularly heroic about it. It's awful. It's gory. It's something to turn your face away from. Who wants to focus on that? It seems to be weakness. It seems to be failure. There doesn't seem to be anything spectacular in it at all. It seems to be awful and ignominious. And I think if you are a philosopher and you're, you're seeking God with your, your mind and your intellect, there's nothing there in the crucifixion. You want to you'll want to focus on the teachings. And if you're somebody who's, you're looking for something spiritual, you're looking for something other in the world, you're seeking, you know, spiritual things, well, again, it just seems to be such a loss. You're going to focus on the miracles. But no. For those that are seeking a saviour, for those that know they need a saviour, then you see great power in the sacrifice. If you're looking for a ransom, someone to ransom you, someone to redeem you, then the shed blood matters. It's what you need. It's what you're looking for. The surrender of the life-giving one the living one, the ever-living one, the one from whom all life flows, his surrender to death. There's power in that. And if you can, if you can see the wisdom of the Creator's plan in a salvation plan to save Adam's lost race, to lift it from the desperate straits that it's in and restore it, a salvation plan that does not depend upon our doing good, that does not depend upon our being heroic, that does not depend upon us in any way, that rests entirely upon the work of God in Jesus Christ on the cross. Well, then there's a salvation plan that will carry us through. There's a salvation plan that we can grab a hold of that will take us through this life and that will last on into eternity where we are saved to the uttermost. Now that is a salvation plan birthed of wisdom and worth hanging on to for all eternity. Why then was it necessary? Why was it necessary that Christ should die? Why was it all needed? The answer, my friend, is love. 
It was necessary because of love. Now, I love my wife. I want to put her first in everything. I'm, I can find no happiness if she is not happy. I love her. I love my sons, my boys. Same is true for them. I love their wives because they love my boys. So if they love my boys, I love my boys, they love my boys, I love them. And now, of course, I've got the grandchildren as well. And I tell you, there's nothing sweeter than those little arms spread wide reaching around you and a little hug with all of his, all of his self and a beautiful smile. That's love. There's power in there and it melts you. But there is huge inherent risk in love because you, when you love somebody, all that you want is for them to return that love. You want them to love you back, but you cannot make somebody love you. You can't do it. If you control them, if you make them say the words, <laughs> it's not love. Love has to be returned freely, doesn't it? Well, now we know about love because we are made in the image of God. And God is love. It all starts from him. And he's made us in his love. And he loves us. And he demonstrates his love for us. And what he's looking for is for that love to be returned. But that means that you and I have free will. It has to be that way. We have to be able to choose. Otherwise, it's not genuine love coming back. Sure, God has the power. But if he controls you and makes you, then it's not love. It's not true, is it? So there's huge free will that's given to us. And with that free will, there's huge risk because we may choose not to love. And when we look at ourselves, well, just to have a look around you, really. I mean, if you say no to love, then there's just hate and fear. If you say no to truth, what is there left for you but lies, confusion? If you say no to the light, there is only the darkness. If you say no to life, then there is only death. Now, you haven't got to look very far at all, have you? At the world around you to find out what choices people are making. And if you're a bit braver, a little bit more humble and honest, you may look at your own life and see, well, what choices am I making? The problem with the world, the problem with humanity, the problem with ourselves is within. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. I'll say that again. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Let me tell you this. If the problem was in government, systems of government, kings, presidents, prime ministers, dictators. If it was in, if it was to do with democracy and voting rights and elections and democracy, if that was the problem, then God would have sent a politician. If the problem was to do with the distribution, the fair distribution of the ample resources that we have on this planet, if money and resources and opportunity could be shared equally so that there would be no more poverty, and you've only got to do the maths and add it up, you can see it could be done. If the problem was that, God would have sent an economist. If the problem is education, if you think, well, if we could all just be educated, if people could learn the basics, 
understand, reading, writing, maths, science, and we could be lifted, perhaps some education in the arts as well. How about that, eh? That we could be lifted. If that was the problem, then God would have sent a teacher, an educationalist, perhaps set up a university. If the problem is to do with medicine, if it's to do with disease and ill health, then he would have sent a doctor. If the problem is to do with pollution and our despoiling of the earth, depleting of its resources, everywhere we go, leaving our rubbish behind, even to the surface of the moon and Mars, which we've touched and left stuff behind. If that is the problem, then God would send an environmentalist. But let me tell you that is not the problem. Let me tell you that God has sent a saviour. He recognised our need and he came himself. He took on our humanity. He was born vulnerable as a baby, raised as a child, lived as a man, took on our suffering, our infirmities, and ultimately, and most importantly, took on our death, dying for us, dying in our place, so that our sin could be forgiven and that we could be reconciled with God. Because it's our relationship with God that is broken, and from that all the other brokenness flows. It's our relationship with God that must be restored. And that's the price that was paid. He sent a saviour so that there could be a perfect sacrifice. His blood was shed. The blood of God shed as a ransom so that you could be redeemed. He gave his life so that we who are subject to death could be released from that tyranny. He came as a healer, he came as a restorer, he came as a mediator, an intercessor. He came for the great exchange. On the cross there is this great exchange. It's called reciprocity. It's an exchange of opposites. He gives his life the perfect one, the life giver, the one from whom all life flows. He gives his life so that we could be redeemed from death. And he takes on our death and dies our death so that we might take on his life and live his life. He takes on our sicknesses and diseases so that we might be healed in his name. He takes on our sin the thing that separates us from God. He takes that on so that we can take on his righteousness and inherit his beautiful and perfect relationship with God. That's the great exchange. Let me come back to the words that Dale read out this morning when the Women arrived at the tomb and they saw that it was empty and there were two angels appeared. And they asked the women this question and I want to ask it to you today. The question was, why are you looking for the living one amongst the dead? Of course, they're there in a cemetery. There's lots of other tombs around as well. They're there in the place of the dead and they're expecting to find the Lord Jesus there. And the angel says, why are you looking for the living one amongst the dead. He's not here, he's risen. Everybody's looking for something today, aren't they? What are you looking for? People look for success, they look for fulfilment, look for security and peace. Perhaps they're looking for wealth, happiness. Perhaps they're looking for love. Are you looking for those things today? Where are you looking for those things? People look for those things in the strangest of places. If you're looking for life, if you're looking for enlightenment, 
Why, why go out at night to look for light? Why be amongst the broken and the desperate if you're looking for wholeness? Why be amongst those that are hurting, hurting one another, hurting themselves, if you're looking for goodness and love? grace and truth why go to those that are building their houses their lives on the sand the shifting sand of fashion and vogue and whatever the next trending thing is if you want to build your house stably your life stably then look to those that have built their house on the rock Come and find the people of light. Be amongst the people of light. Be amongst the people who are secure. Be amongst the people who have found peace. Be amongst those that have joy. Be amongst those that are found wholeness in their lives. Found that shalom peace. Be amongst those that can point you to a saviour that can heal and that can restore and that can forgive. Be amongst the Easter people, be amongst the church, be amongst those that are witnesses of this great message. They will introduce you to their Saviour and their Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's a passage in Acts where Paul is preaching and he says this, he concludes his message with this message and I, I want to say this and repeat this today. He says that God has overlooked the, time, the times of ignorance in the past. But he is now commanding all people everywhere that they should repent and believe in the gospel. Because he's fixed a day on which the Lord Jesus will return. He has found his judge in the Lord Jesus, the judge will return and the day is fixed for judgment. And it wouldn't be right of me just to tell you about all the wonderful things and leave you feeling that you've got an option to opt in at any point that you want to. I want to give you the full counsel of God, so I need to leave you with a warning and say that it is true that judgment is coming, that it is true that this Lord Jesus that we we celebrate and we rejoice and we're glad that he's raised from the dead and ascended to heaven. I want to tell you, he's coming back. And when he comes back, it's going to be different. You have an option now to meet the Lord Jesus as your saviour and Lord. But I just want to tell you really clearly, if you don't take up that option, you will meet him as your judge. Now, the Bible is very clear that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So whatever you think now, whatever you say now, be assured your knee will bow and your tongue will confess. You will say it with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. But by then, it's too late. So you meet him now as a saviour or you meet him then as a judge. And what, what will you say? People have all these ideas about, you know, oh, I'll say, you know, I did my best. Life was hard for me, but I did my best. Here's the good things I've done. I haven't done anything too bad. I'm not a murderer, you know. What are you going to say if you're stood there before the judge and the judge says to you, I came to be your saviour. I came and gave my life to redeem you so that you don't have to stand here in the dock right now. I came and gave everything so that you wouldn't have to face judgment now. And now there's nothing left. God is holding back judgment. I mean, honestly, sometimes, if you're like me, you must listen to the news and think, Lord, it's time for all of this to end. Please wind everything up because this is getting really, really horrible and serious and terrible. And yet God holds back 
because he wants to give more and more time for more and more to be saved. But in the end, there's no more holding back. Now this eternal life that I'm proclaiming to you, this forgiveness of sins in his name, comes from repentance. That's what it says here. That repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed. Let me talk about repentance. Repentance. It's a bit of French for you, isn't it? Repentance. Rethink your life. Rethink your life. It's a 180 degree about turn. If you're heading in this direction, that's your destination, that's what your focus is, that's what your mind is on. You pick up luggage and equipment that you think might help you get there. You travel with friends that you think might help you get there. You form relationships with those that are going in that direction. That 180 degree turn is a big change. I don't want to pussyfoot about on this one. It's a big change. Now you've got a completely different destination in mind. Now the luggage that you've got, you've got to drop. You don't need that where you're going. You need to acquire new stuff. Relationships will change. Don't have any doubt about it. The folk that you were traveling with, they're going off in that direction. If they don't turn with you, it's very hard for you to maintain those relationships. And you'll want to pick up new relationships with people that are traveling this way. So there are big changes. Jesus himself is very clear about that and says, count the cost. Think it through. Don't make an impulsive, emotional decision. Think it through. Work it out. But I'll tell you this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you lay down everything. You lose your life. It's the end of life on your terms and it's the beginning of life on his terms. You lay down your life and those that lose their life will gain it. And those that seek to gain their life, you hang on, in the end, there's nothing. So there's a big change to make. There's a big cost to count up. I don't want to, you know, play that down. But you can't keep your life anyway. <laughs> you can't keep it together anyway. It falls apart anyway. And in the end, what will save you from death but nothing? You can't do that. So you're going to lose it all anyway. So give it up now and gain. Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it in all of its abundance, all of its fullness, all of its richness. The creator's plan for your life, not your plan for your life. See, in the end, that's what sin is. Sin is a little word. It's got I in the middle. I in the middle. That's what sin is. It's me saying to God, not your will, but my will be done. Remember that bit in, uh, in that film where Bruce is given God's powers for a day and he's there on the top of the steeple, isn't he? Hanging on the top of the steeple and he says, I am Bruce Almighty, my will be done. Well, you know, I want to tell you, there's something about that in all of us, isn't there? We want to say, I am who I am, my will be done. I'm going to live the life I want to live. I'm going to do the things I want to do. I'm going to be the person I want to be. That's sin. <laughs> okay, guys, that's it. That's that rebellion against a loving creator who has a plan and a purpose for your life. That's what we need to be saved from. That's why Jesus came and died for us. So you either take him as Lord of all or you don't take him at all, okay? Jesus is either saviour and Lord or he's nothing to you. You can't, this isn't, this isn't a religion that you can dip into. This isn't a religion you can say, well, I'll have a little bit of that because that's good, that's useful. I need a bit of that. I'll have a little bit of this. Yeah, that could be helpful but I don't like that and I don't like this. Christianity is not like that. Christianity is about a relationship with God Almighty, <laughs> Lord and Saviour. And you're either all in or you're not in at all. There's no pick and mix with it. This is not about self-improvement. The church, you know, there's no consumer option here. 
Some people want to shop around and they say, well, I like those Christians and I like the songs that they sing. And, I, you know, dump all of that idea. We're not coming to this as, you know, we're not making the decisions here. This is a challenge about what are you going to do? God himself has come and given himself for you on the cross. What's your response to that? Is it going to be, oh, you know, forget a consumer response. You can hear what I'm saying, can't you? <laughs> They said, the first people that heard this message, they cried out and said, what must we do to be saved? Peter, who was preaching the message, he said three things. He said, repent, be baptised and receive the Holy Spirit. What must I do to be saved? I want you to, if you're, if you're at a point, you know, this is the point to get to. The point to get to is where you are crying out, what must I do to be saved? The point to get to is recognising not this is a little bit helpful, I might have a bit of this, a bit of that. It's about, my God, I am in terrible, eternal jeopardy. I need a saviour. Is there anything out there that can help me? Is there anybody out there that can help me? Let me bring you to the saviour. Let me bring you to the foot of the cross. It's when you get to that point where you are appealing you realise, I must be reconciled with God. I must be reconciled with God. And you're realising you've got nothing else to bring. Your good works amount to nothing. Your promises to do better next time are empty and useless. You face the jeopardy of judgement and you realise, oh. then you recognise the Saviour. Then you understand why Jesus came and died on a cross. Then, you, then you'll give it all up without hesitation and run to the foot of the cross and embrace a salvation that will wipe away your sin, that will set you right with God. You will rejoice in forgiveness, wallow in it and be so pleased that your sin can be forgiven and that you can be right with God. And you'll run to the waters of baptism You'll want, that, you'll want that outward symbolism of being buried to the old life and the old life flowing away and being raised to the new life to go on with God. And you will cry out to be filled with the Spirit of God, hungry for the Spirit of God. Let the Spirit of God fill you. You'll be like these guys where then the Word of God is open to you and you'll see him in the Scriptures. You'll know him and fellowship with him each day. And you'll have a hope for eternity that you'll be walking towards. You'll found your life on the rock. You'll be saved to the uttermost. That's what we proclaim. We proclaim Christ crucified. Right, I better get the worship team up here now, otherwise I'm never going to stop. <laughs> Let's get the worship band up. This is what we've got to celebrate. If you know that this is true for your life, Let's give thanks for that. Let's celebrate that. Let's be so grateful. Let's be, let's be outpouring in thankfulness and grace and praising God for what he's done for us. And if this isn't true for you and you don't know that, maybe this is the first time you've heard it, let me just say to you, let those words ring around in your heart and don't leave here without talking to somebody about it. Our God is a God who pursues. And you'll know, if he's pursuing you this morning, you'll know he's on your case, wanting to win you over to himself. So listen to the words that are spoken, listen to the gospel, think about them, count that cost. And uh, let's worship.